And that's my colleague Ganesh. We're both at a firm called Gramner, and we're into data visualization. This is a talk on uh, visualizing text. Uh, it's a slightly unusual and certainly a new field. Text is not something that we tend to analyze too well, and it's certainly not still not audible. Wow. Text is not something we analyze too well. Uh, we're a lot better with structured data, numeric and quantitative data. And it's certainly not something that we know how to visualize well. Actually, there aren't too many things we know how to visualize well. So this is a fairly emerging field. And I'll talk about some of the advances that we've made, some of the things we've learned, some examples that we've created, some examples that we've seen that are really good, and hope that you'll get something out of it. Uh, <coughs> my interest in text and text visualization goes back to about a decade and a half uh, when I was first introduced to Calvin and Hobbes. Now, Calvin is an amazing character. You know? <coughs> Calvin's dad is actually an even more amazing character for giving advice like this. In fact, there's this subreddit co uh, which is about explain like I'm Calvin's dad. You know, just talking about how you give explanations exactly like Calvin's dad. Now, I love giving examples from Calvin and Hobbes and when I was at BCG we were trying to create slides and every now and then I'd want to say let me pick that one slide somewhere where Calvin was talking about not understanding stuff or TV being the best medium or whatever and the trouble is you just can't find it. Do a Google search, nope. <coughs> Ucomics which distributes Calvin and Hobbes does not have a searchable interface. So uh, in 2001 when I got my first laptop and was commuting between Bandra and Nariman point every day on the train, I spent uh, all that time typing out every single strip of Calvin and Hobbes between 2001 to 2006, and I completed that task in London. <laughs> That's what I used. Uh, it was an Excel sheet where as I scroll up and down the, uh, <coughs> the rows, I could see the different strips. In fact, I can show you the Excel sheet. That's what it looks like as I go up and down. It shows me the strip and I would just you know, go there and say, okay, what's this? Taste it. You'll love it. Blah, blah, blah. And that was my workflow for typing this in. It took a long time, uh, but we finally got there. And eventually, now that the content is there, it's a question of how does one search. And you've got it in Excel, you can copy and paste in anywhere else and you can search it. But I figured a web interface would be slightly easier and created a small Calvin and Hobbes site where you can search. So for example, if I want to search for, oops, that's not what I want to do. If I want to search for the tracer bullet strips. Okay, so that's the first tracer bullet comic. That's the second one. That's the third one. Or if I want to search all the ones where uh, snowballs were mentioned or spaceman spiff, or Miss Wormwood, you know, good stuff. <laughs> it went on uh, Reddit and a few other places a number of times, and one of those happy occasions, uh, it was noticed by Ucomics legal team, and this site is now shut down. <laughs> I wrote back saying, look, happy to offer this text. Feel free to use it on your site. I'll build it for you if you want. No response. But <coughs> the good part is this text exists and I have this corpus and I started playing around with it which marks the start of my interest in text analysis. I said, what does Bill Watterson talk about? What are the kinds of words that he uses more often? And that brings us to the classic example of text visualization. If there's one sort of perfect piece of text visualization that one looks at today, it's a word cloud. You take words, you plot them, lay them out in a way that, such that the size of the words is proportional to the, to the frequency with which it's mentioned, and <coughs> you lay it out so that they just about fit. So clearly, Calvin and Hobbes is a lot about Calvin, to a good extent about Hobbes, no, good, see, mom, like, so on. And you get a sense of what this is about. If you want to get a very quick sense of what any piece of text is about, this is a great way of doing it. And I'll show you some examples of how you would be able to create a word cloud within a few seconds. <coughs> now, Word clouds come in many shape, uh, shapes and forms. Uh, there's this guy called uh, Jeff Clark who goes by the alias of Neoformics on whose site you'll find some incredible examples. So, for example, here's a visualization, a word cloud of words that appear on Apple's website shaped in Apple's logo. A word cloud doesn't have to be 
a homogeneous mass. It doesn't have to be arbitrarily shaped. You can shape it to pretty much any shape you want. And the shape in itself can convey a meaning. So for example, this is a picture of Obama, but it's actually made up of a word cloud. And the words in this word cloud are the words he uses in a State of the Union speech. So a lot about change and hope and so on. Many of these words are repeated. In fact, uh, you'll also see on his site a picture of Albert Einstein in which the word Einstein is what is used in varying sizes to create this image. This is a combination of data and art. The shape of the picture is mostly the art part of it. But to the extent that the size of the words behind it are proportional to the frequency with which they, they use, that's where the data part of it comes in. Now, it's possible to create a word cloud extremely easily. There's a site called wordle.net, which in my opinion is one of the best uh, word cloud sites. And all it takes is, let's do one thing. I'm going to take the uh, Prime Minister's Independence Day speech in 2011, copy it, go to wordle.net slash create, paste this text, click go, run this time. And there you go. That's all it takes. Uh, let's look at how you can play around with this. I don't like this font. I like cool Vetica. Or I like uh, Lee Gothic is pretty decent. I don't like this color scheme. I can make it a plain black and white scheme. Or Indian earthy or whatever. I can go for straighter edges if I like straight ed edges. But rounded edges tend to look good. You can lay it out in any random way. Or half and half. Half horizontal, half vertical. Or entirely vertical. But usually horizontal layouts are the easiest to read. And you can can play around with the word schemes and so on. It's fast and it's very tough to get this kind of a smooth, beautiful layout. But also, you can see what he's talking about. He's talking about the country a whole lot. He's talking about brothers and sisters. In fact, he's talking about brothers and sisters a little too much, probably. <coughs> no, certainly talking about the government. He's talking about prices. He's talking about political. He's talking about the parliament. He's talking about development. He's talking about people, economic. You don't have to read, what was it? 20 paragraphs to get a sense of what this is about. You know what he's talking about. In fact, one of uh, <coughs> the partners that we had at VCG said, look, I don't need to read any of Abdul Kalam's speeches. I know what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about children. He's going to talk about science. He's going to talk about education. You, know. <coughs> you don't always need to read something to get a gist of what is being spoken about in that context. And word clouds help a lot. Now, <coughs> the trouble with word clouds, though, is so when you take a look at this one, you don't often get the context in which this is being mentioned. So when he's saying country, what is he saying about the country? When he's saying brothers or sisters, what is, he, what is he telling his brothers and sisters to do? When he says also, also what? So the context is something that's a little difficult. And there is a technique called concordance, which is popularly used to bring this about. Uh, let me give you an example uh, of a, concord a piece of concordance in Calvin and Hobbes. So if I want to search for, let's say, what does Calvin think about girls? Okay, so Calvin thinks girls are slimy, slimy, slimy. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the bulk of what he thinks about it. He certainly doesn't like them. Uh, girls and the associated words would be slugs and sissy and well, Susie, which sort of rhymes. And he's, in fact, gone as far as creating this get rid of, sorry, G-R-O-S-S, -S, this club. Get rid of slimy girls club for, well, for a purpose that is fairly obvious. Uh, then you can just explore this. So what does he think about secret? Click on secret. Okay, so it's a secret note, secret note. Talks a lot about secret notes. Uh, what does he think is important? Uh, actually, he thinks lots of things are important. I'm expecting important calls, doing big things. You get a sense of the context of this. Now, what if we could combine these two? So if we could combine both uh, a, concordance pic uh, a, a concordance with a word cloud, uh, so now no such tool existed, no such tool exists to my knowledge, so we ended up having to build one. Uh, this is available at sip.sanand.net. Now I'll, I'll explain what this SIP bit does. But first let me demonstrate this to you. So these are all the words uh, in Calvin and Hobbes. The larger the word, the more often it occurs. So uh, Calvin is pretty common, Calvin ball is pretty common. Uh, the smaller words like biology, bidding and so on are not so common. You can play around this with this a little bit. Um, you can ignore the common words. So those are the words that are, oh, sorry. You, you can ignore the infrequent words. So these are the words that are mentioned fairly often. You can play around with the scale a little bit, increases scale, decreases scale. Um, the contrast, now that bears a bit of explanation. Now, you may have heard of Amazon's statistically improbable phrases. They 
brought this, uh, uh, they popularized this term. When they were describing books, they said, if you wanted to find out what a book was about, if you want to get the key elements of the plot, you don't need to read the book. We'll just give you the improbable phrases. Now, the improbable phrases are simply those phrases that tend to occur in the book reasonably often, but not as often in the English language. So you just say, this book has the, word, has the phrase, uh, let's say, Spaceman's Fifth. 5% uh, of the time. The English language has that 0.05% of the time. So that's an extremely improbable fa phrase. Whereas something like good luck occurs 10% of the time here and 5% of the time in the English corpus, so it's not such a big deal. So that's what's going on behind the scenes here. The darker the word, the more improbable it is in the English language. The lighter the word, the more probable it is. So if I wanted to see what are the words that are very improbable, I can just increase the contrast on this one. Hobbes, Spiff, Susie. These are among the more often used words that are quite uh, improbable in the English language. Um, reduce the contrast. Stuff like this. <laughs> you can play around with this and see uh, what where that gets you. The site is sip.s-anand.net. Uh, <coughs> and this brings together two techniques of uh, text visualization, a word cloud and a concordance. Where does one use this sort of a thing? Are there any business examples where this tends to get used? Actually, yes, and in a number of places. So to give you a couple, uh, we are doing a piece of work with a bank where we took all of the text that was mentioned in their uh, the, the transactions. This was actually from checks. So let's take all of the uh, text that's written in these check transactions, the, the two or the description or whatever, and put it all together and create a word cloud. So a lot of it is about cash, so you pay as cash. But you can also see some details around where it's going to. So for instance, Fabit is going to HDFC. Uh, there's a bit, a bit going to Reliance. There's a bit going to escrow accounts. You can also see the kinds of names that these checks are being written to. A lot of Shahs, Patels. And th this is incidentally Bombay data. So there is a uh, you know, <coughs> slight bias there. But I suspect that this may be the case even otherwise. Uh, a lot of payments being made to companies, limited, public limited companies, LICs and so on. And then you can start saying, okay, these are the ones uh, that I'm going to focus on. So for instance, the uh, organization we were working with, they were looking to see what are the organizations they need, need to partner with to minimize their payment costs. So we made a simple list and said, okay, those are your top 10 payments. You need to worry about LIC payments, MTNL payments, and BSES payments. Between these three, they cover the vast majority of where people write checks to. And this is despite them not being able to track the various accounts to which this check is being sent to. So it helps summarize what is available in an, in an unstructured form. In a very different example, uh, let's take HasGeek. The HasGeek job board, if you were to, uh, sorry, for those of you who are not aware of uh, the HasGeek job board, HasGeek has a job board where people can post jobs and uh, I pulled out the description of all of the jobs that uh, were posted since last August. Those are the words that people are looking for in the series. Lots of experience. You know. <laughs> if you're a fresher, you may as well not apply. Uh, <coughs> Bangalore, that's where everything happens. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find many other cities. Mumbai to a certain extent, but I mean, just look at the contrast between these. You better know JavaScript. Uh, <coughs> well, no, okay, actually. Next to experience, you should have lots of knowledge and skills, be good at teamwork, hardcore web developer or web designer, one or the other. Now, let's, sorry, F feel free to ask questions as we go along, by the way. Yeah. Is it possible to use a phrase or an engram to do this? Yes, and I'll show you an example where we do that. The trouble with a phrase or an engram is differentiating between a uh, multiple ends. So how do I know whether a word is, so let's say I have call center. Now I, that has two words, call center and the phrase call center. So how do I know when I use call independently and when I use call center the phrase together? Tough problem, I don't have the answer. Some people do have techniques that I'm not aware of, but techniques exist. But a simple way of doing it is to say, look, I'm going to take not just every single word, but I'm going to take the words and bigrams and trigrams and so on. And I'll show you an example where we did unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and walk through that. Yes? Hmm? The site, the uh, question is, uh, what does the site visual.ly do? Uh, does it do something similar? Not quite. They're more an aggregator of visualizations. So they, uh, you send them a visualization, they'll show you what it's about.
I will repeat the question. Is it possible to figure out if a word like call center is more relevant by using? Uh, the uh, question is, can't we use uh, other uh, corpuses like the Google search queries or some other corpora to find out if a phrase occurs more often than not? Absolutely. You don't even need to go to a third party corpus. You can just look at it within your own data set and try and see if, for instance, a word is used like call and it is invariably associated with call center immediately afterwards. You may as well knock off that word, which is what I, you know, I've used. I mean, it's, it's just a simple algorithm. If a word is used with another word more than 50% of the time, then just knock off the individual word. It's a very, very crude heuristic, but it works. Uh, so well, since we're talking about this one, I'm going to uh, show you the uh, <coughs> the combined version of this. So, uh, let's increase, the, let's ignore the common English words. So, what are people looking for? Uh, primarily, they're looking for people at Bangalore uh, doing analytics. Now, what do they want in analytics? They want data and analytics, web analytics, data analytics, web analytics. So that's pretty much it, data analytics and web analytics. Uh, what do they want with Facebook? They want to launch Facebook and Twitter presence, Facebook Connect, Facebook Connect, Facebook campaigns. What do they want to do with optimization? It's SEM optimization, performance optimization, search engine optimization, performance op optimization, just two kinds of optimizations that people want, search engine and performance optimization. You get a sense of what people are looking for just by playing around with this kind of data set. Another way of using this is uh, we took survey data uh, where a services organization had s uh, asked their customers to fill out where, you know, a, a series of questions and asked them to be rated on a scale of one to five, one is bad, five is good. We said, okay, let's take all of the good ratings together and see what words are common there. And that's the green stuff on top. And what are all the bad ratings? Put them together at the bottom and see what the problem is. So clearly this uh, organization is great from a flexibility perspective, uh, good teamwork, uh, decent from a customer support perspective, not bad at communication, but the trouble is technical, quality, <coughs> no idea what this is, communication, communication occurs in both places. So there are some people that think communication is good, communication is, some people think communication is bad. And without having to go through the you know, hundreds of pages of comments, you get a sense of where we're doing well, where we're not doing well. Those are some examples where it can be applied, uh, you know, in sort of business, in the business world. This is an example where we took, uh, in grams in my previous life, uh, we were looking at intranet search results and said, let's see what are the words that are searched most often. So the word that was searched more often, are you able to see this? The word searched most often was management followed by case, followed by value, blah, blah, blah. And the question is, what is the context in which these words are being searched for? So let's take management. Now, management is primarily being searched for in the context of change management 8% of the time program management 6% of the time, performance management, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I get an idea of what this is about. Uh, let's look at what we, so when somebody searches for portfolio, click on that. What does that mean? Okay, portfolio is mainly about portfolio management. So this is one of those cases where if somebody's looking at, the, at two words, portfolio and portfolio management, you may as well knock off portfolio uh, as a standalone because almost half the time it's being associated with portfolio management, though it's also being associated to a certain extent with portfolio rationalization, portfolio analysis, and so on. Uh, these are ways of exploring this uh, data set, which is search data set, in a somewhat uh, semi-structured fashion. But one of the things that is missing here is now, while I can get the context at any point, I can't do deep explorations. So for example, I can say, okay, let's start with uh, application, see how application is used. Okay, within application, it's being used a lot with mobile. So click on mobile, see how it's being used, etc. But it would be nice to have some kind of a network diagram where, you know, sort of like Google's uh, search interface that used to exist, the search wheel, where you click on a word, it tells you the related concepts, you click on that, you search for the related concepts and so on. Uh, obviously, I couldn't resist doing this with Calvin and Hobbes. So this is what it looks like. Let me zoom in. So if you start with Calvin, the closest associated words, the words that are immediately next to it are Calvin bed, Calvin and Calvin. Calvin stop, Calvin doing, Calvin Hobbes, Calvin mom. Hobbes is a lot closer, just come a lot closer. So let me click on some of these words. So let's take, uh, uh, let's see, doing, doing what? Calvin's mostly doing homework or not rather. Uh, <laughs> Calvin bed, Calvin has to go to bed tonight. Calvin here, let here, I don't know what that is. Calvin in time, hmm, there's a lot around time. So bedtime clearly, time machine. 
Calvin ha plays around a lot with the time machine. Uh, what about dad? What does dad do? Dad said something about me to Calvin. Not as interesting. Uh, Calvin's work, great. None of these have any interesting words. Mom is hmm, fairly sure about a number of things. Mom just said something or the other. And this is another way of playing around with text data. So once you know the relationships between pairs of words and you know what's closer, what's further away, you can start exploring concepts, you can start exploring search terms, you can start exploring pretty much anything that follows the structure of a network and see where that takes you. Let me show you some examples from, oh sorry, sorry. let me show you some examples that have been uh, used uh, elsewhere. So this for instance is a Twitter stream graph. Uh, Twitter stream graph is, well, you search for a phrase, in this particular case you search for the phrase data visualization and it shows you a timeline where different words are depicted as well, a, an area graph. So this period of time there were lots of mentions of words associated with data visualization. The Guardian was talking a lot about data visualization, team, arcade, retro, these were associated a lot. In this particular time there's a lot talking about, a lot of mention about Twitter, I presume that's Twitter Inc lot of mention about social networks here and that's another way of seeing what is the ebb or the flow of uh, <coughs> some of the words over time in the context of a specific, a specific word. This is available on Jeff Clark's site, Neoformix and you can try out various words. It tends to fail every now and then but you might get lucky with this. Another is a trends map where you can take the same words and plot it instead of on a timeline plot it geographically. So what are the words that are trending in specific locations? So for example in India when I took the screenshot, uh, the central uh, regions of India were talking a lot about Cargill and revenue and Modi. Amitabh was fairly popular in Mumbai, isn't he always? And furniture, Muslims, what is this, uh, riots, those were being mentioned a fair bit in South. And this is a real time uh, uh, feed that you can check out on trends map, uh, that doesn't look too good. Let's go on to another example, uh, yeah. yeah. That's a visualization of the sentiment of the Bible by the openbible.info website. Now sentiment analysis is for those of you familiar with text analysis a very hot topic and the crux of it is to take a phrase and determine whether you can, uh, you know, whether it's a positive sentiment, you know, whether say for example somebody tweeting about you likes you or doesn't like you, somebody tweeting about a topic likes a topic or doesn't like a topic. And there are various varying degrees of accuracy in sentiment analysis. I'm not going to go into the content or the sort of the technique of the analysis. Let's just assume that uh, there are ways of identifying the sentiment of a given phrase somewhat accurately. And what this does is starts off with the and the Old Testament moves on to the New Testament. So the Bible starts off on a slightly positive note, becomes increasingly negative for a while, slight respite there, fairly negative, and then things look good. So after the time of Moses, things are good, you know, which we sort of know. And around the time of Joshua, things are good, but around the time between Joshua and David, there is a bit of strife, and during the time of monarchy, things are mostly good, but then it starts dipping, and goes all the way up to here, at which point, starting with Jesus, there's the New Testament and uh, that's around the time when there was a lot of resistance to what he was talking about, formation of the early church and so on. Uh, now, this sort of a visualization, uh, actually I, I should take a brief detour, I want to talk about this whole concept of circular visualizations, I mean they're, they look really neat and classy. Uh, not quite related to text but I do want to mention that we were playing around with audio. We took a bunch of songs and said let's see if we can plot songs in a similar way. So uh, the, the way this is plotted is let's take Eric Clapton's Wonderful Tonight. Song starts here. These are the low beats, these are the high beats. So that's the spectrum of the song and you know, sort of on your, uh, uh, the darker the color on the boundary, the, the deeper the beats the brighter the color uh, on the inside, the higher the treble and all the, the frequencies in between are shown here. So now Wonderful Tonight is a relatively uniform song, there aren't too many changes. Whereas if you look at Queen, We Will Rock You, you, know, you can see where the pattern is completely different. The duration of the song is depicted by the length of the arc in this particular case. 
just want to show you that circular vis visualizations can actually compress a fair bit of information into a relatively compact space. Uh, <coughs> another way of looking at data is on a time series, but this is shown in a somewhat different way. This is a calendar that shows the sentiment of the Calvin and Hobbes published on that day. So, uh, it started on the 17th of November, uh, goes on to December, January and so on. This is a long trend and I'll show you the, the full uh, trend. But he, he starts off on a happy note, not so happy the next couple of days. Varies a fair bit, but you'll notice that he's extremely neutral on Sundays. All of the Sunday strips, which are the color strips, you know, absolutely uh, no strong sentiments one way or the other. And uh, so that was a relatively happy time that you know, more or less, but it starts turning darker. One might want to test if uh, Bill Watterson was a bad Monday person, whether his Monday comics tend to be a lot more negative than uh, <coughs> usual. Uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll show you a slightly longer version of this. So that's that's the point actually. So maybe he was uh, being very neutral on Saturdays rather than Sundays. You never know. No, but he did have the habit of writing uh, fairly early. So it may not be a reflection of uh, his mood versus the day he wrote it on. But it certainly is a reflection of the format because the format on Sundays is a color larger strip than it is on any other day. Uh, and you can get a sense of what the pattern looks like over time. See, is he starts off being reasonably polarized. There's heavy reds and greens to start with. But over time, it tends to tone down. And in the middle, so in this region, he's not that opinionated. There was a stretch where he was fairly OK. And then towards the end, it starts picking up again. OK, uh, so there are many APIs that, oh, sorry, the question was, uh, what are the, how do you figure out uh, if the emotion is positive or negative, or you know, how do you figure out the sentiment? There are enough APIs to do that. In fact, uh, <coughs> at the end of this talk, or sometime, if we have time, I'll show you the code that was used to generate this. I generated this this morning. And uh, it doesn't take too long to create something like this. Another way of looking at data is, this one. So this was done for the US presidential elections. Uh, on any given day, you show a couple of bars, so that sort of represents the day. And the reds and the blues indicate whether they are Democrats or uh, whether, okay, sorry, let me step back. This is about uh, what are the news sentiments about either party or either candidate. Now, <coughs> there are six combinations. So there are no, the, the, firstly, the reds are the mentions about the Republicans. The blues are the mentions about the Democrats. If it's got blocks in between, then it means that it's a mention about the uh, party. If it's a straight block like this one, it's a mention about the candidate, McCain, in this particular case. Uh, and if, if it's darker, then it's talking about a larger number of feeds that are talking about the same topic. So you take news topics, aggregate them, and say, I have 20 news items talking about the same topic. I have five news items talking about the same topic. The 20 news items one becomes darker. The, the five news items becomes lighter. And you plot this, and you get a pattern like this. For instance, this was on October 10th, where uh, Palin was accused of abusing power. And I, I don't quite know the context of this, but there, was a there were apparently a large number of media mentions. And you can see that the reds are generally below the line. The further below the line, the more negative it is. So here is a case where it's a position that indicates the sentiment, not the uh, color, because the color is being used for the party. And consistently, you'll find the reds below, the, especially the dark reds, barring one exception, where uh, McCain said that no, that intervention was not unlawful. And that garnered them a bit of good press. But otherwise, consistently, the party has been doing negative. This is, in fact, an example of an actual analysis that was used by the party, uh, created by the University of Constance in Germany. Uh, another way of looking at content is if you take the State of the Union speech by Obama in <coughs> 2010 versus 2011, the words are sized, the bubbles are sized based on how often the words are mentioned. The words on the left were words he used more often in 2010 
the words on the right he used more often in 2011. Words in between were used in both instances in roughly the proportion of their location. So you can see that 2010 is largely about financial bill problems, million pay, all of the financial crisis issues, whereas 2011 is about the future, best, success, high idea, education, research, technology, clearly an election year. I'll walk you through some, or rather I'll ha ask my colleague Ganesh to walk you through some examples that we've done in uh, somewhat unusual spaces. Let me hand the mic over. Thanks, Anand. Uh, we'll talk about some interesting case studies from the Indian context. I'll stay away from Calvin and Hobbes. It's not my cup of tea. Uh, we wanted to take up some Indian epic and uh, uh, visualize large volumes of uh, text. And Mahabharata was an ideal uh, candidate for this because it has over 1.8 million words spread across 18 chapters and over 500 sub-chapters. So uh, we read, uh, we actually scanned the complete text of Mahabharata in, uh, in English and uh, created some visualizations on top of it. We show a sample of it here. The first one is a simple uh, occurrence visualization. Uh, this shows when each of the characters of Mahabharata uh, had mentions in each of the chapters. So we have 18 chapters and each of the boxes, each of the boxes that you see here, the, uh, the length of the box is proportional to the volume of text in that sub-chapter. If I click on any, uh, any one particular character, it shows in which chapter the character was mentioned. So uh, for instance, Devayani is again not a central uh, character in the plot, a, a subplot or a sub-story. There are hundreds of characters like this and hundreds of stories uh, which uh, happen in the Mahabharata, apart from the central one. So this, uh, this tool actually helps us to interactively explore where each characters appear and what is the kind of interaction between each of them. For instance, we could see where uh, Karna and Kunti were separated and where they got uh, united again and, and, and stuff like that. So this is the position is uh, relative to the mention, whether it's mentioned starting the text or at the end of the chapter. So it's again relative to the specific mention. Uh, so this is one analysis and then we looked at uh, a network diagram to see the closeness of different characters because the first visualization just talks about the occurrence. Whereas we wanted to see how closely the characters are to each other. So we took up uh, every pair of character in Mahabharata and we looked at how many words separate each of the characters. So it could be five words, 50 words, or 500 words. So the average degree of words of separation between two characters was taken and computed for the complete text. And we created a network diagram uh, based on that. So uh, each of the characters are shown and then the, the position in the network and the connection is based on how uh, close each of the characters are. So we can uh, see that Yudhishthira is again the cent a central character in the plot and there are other people uh, around him. And Bhima and Karna are also fairly well networked, if, if I may use. Uh, and there are a lot of other characters, uh, like Nakula Sahadeva and so many other characters which are uh, interacting with more with certain specific characters, but are on the periphery of the plot. And for instance, Gandhari, uh, apart from Dhritarashtra, she is quite close to Dhritara and also to Kunti. So this brings out a lot of uh, uh, interesting stories and analysis possible. So this again is, is an interactive version which is available on our website. You can play around with it and see what is the, the strength of the network and how it moves around. Sorry, I didn't get the question. You're asking where Yeah, it's actually the, the mentions, uh, the number of words, uh, it is the two characters are separate. It could be interaction, direct interaction between the characters or it could be they just spaced, uh, they're talking to different characters but spaced apart. So the, the closest we could do was look at the number of words which separate the characters, which is an approximation for the closeness of the characters. Others uh, can't hear you. Yeah, so see, so look at the old text. I think we are only doing textual analysis. Yeah. Uh, 
So the question was, uh, how do you handle uh, people having different names? So for instance, uh, Arjuna has a hundred names uh, yeah. in the text. So to the extent that we knew the names, we just uh, merged them all into the same name, Arjuna. Krishna has even more names. And to the extent that we could, you know, we managed, you know, Krishna, Janardana, Govinda, the whole works. Uh, we left out some of the edge, edge cases. Some, you know, domain knowledge does help. Next one, actually we are running out of time. Uh, we did an analysis of uh, all the tweets in India. So we took up one week worth of geocoded tweets uh, from India. There were about 80,000 tweets. Uh, so this again includes only the geocoded tweets. And uh, so we did a document comparison analysis. Uh, so similar to the other one that you saw uh, the US case study. So here we have uh, shown a bubble chart wherein uh, the the bubble, the size of the bubble is proportional to the number of mentions of that particular word and we have uh, separated into two sections, the words by people with low followers whereas the words by people with uh, more number of followers. So certain things which clearly come out are uh, people with high followers tend to use a lot of hashtags and they tend to be relatively, if I may use the word, more polite with good mornings, good day, thanks and so on. And people with low followers tend to use uh, words no traffic and high extremely more, uh, the, co the correlation between uh, the low followers and the words, uh, they use this, these three words is very high. So uh, there are other uh, contrast analysis which you've done, again in the interest of time I'm skipping those, they are available in our blog, so I'll move to the next one. So this uh, looks at which names score better marks. So this is uh, uh, interesting and our favorite data set. So, uh, so this data is actually from Tamil Nadu board exams, the 10th and 12th uh, standard board exams has records of over 10 lakh students and uh, for more than 5 years of past 5 years of data. So what we have done here is this particular analysis, we have taken up uh, uh, interactive tree map to show all the uh, or rather the top 5000 names, the top 5000 names and then the boxes show the number of uh, occurrence of that particular name. Obviously the the bigger boxes mean uh, the no names are more popular, the smaller boxes are the reverse. And the color indicates the score. Uh, dark blue means higher marks and closer to white is low. Uh, certain interesting things come out. If I look at high marks, there are uh, certain pa specific kinds of names which come up. Shweta, Shriya and more urban city kind of names come up here. Uh, and apart from that we also saw a lot of Agarwals, Guptas, Jains and a lot of North Indian names coming here. This is from Tamil Nadu. And uh, low marks again you see some big boxes and many of the names are again more traditional names like Murugesan, Ayyappan and, and, and so on. <laughs> uh, another uh, interesting observation from this is that uh, some of the more common names are uh, have bigger boxes and the marks are averaged out. Uh, whereas the the less common names either have very high scores or very low scores obviously because the averaging effect uh, impacts it. So, so this is one of the analysis we could uh, do on this. Yeah. It doesn't, that's right, yeah we haven't factored that in, there's another visualization we've got that does it. But uh, the rough rule of thumb is uh, <laughs> in terms of the, uh, by and large the polarized marks uh, have a lesser standard deviation and the ones in the middle have a higher standard deviation. I'll just quickly wrap up. Uh, <coughs> the one point that we wanted to convey is text which is generally considered un unstructured has a fair bit of metadata that you can extract out of it if you just try hard enough. If there's one thing that we want you to remember it is look hard within text you'll find weird structures like similarity, associated met metadata and so on from which you can pull out the data and then visualize it. Last uh, one second plug about us, our organization is called Gramna, you can find out more about some of our work including some of these examples at gramna.com. We are into data visualization and you can reach us at this location. I guess we are out of time so we probably won't take questions. Since we just have, uh, we have lunch right after this, um, uh, we have time for a couple of questions if you have any. Otherwise, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. The uh, question is which platform is it made on? Python. 
Like in the example of Mahabharata, the noun that you were looking for, were you using any parser or it was just your own knowledge? In a sentence, if you are looking like, if you are using a Stanford parser, you are looking for the noun, then you can have all the combinations of noun. Yeah, so, so did you use those parsers or something? Uh, let me just rephrase that question to how do we figure out the names. Uh, no, we didn't really, uh, we didn't need a parser. It actually turned out to be simple enough to get it down to 90% accuracy by saying, uh, you know, by just looking at the capitalized words. So we said, take all the words that begin with a capital letter and ignore those words that are already in the dictionary. That gets you to 90% accuracy and then we just did a ma manual filtering. Sorry, that wasn't the question. Okay. Yes, absolutely. It turned out that in this particular case, it was mostly names. Sorry, the comment was that might have been places that might have been names. So how do you, you know, did we do anything smarter than that? It turns out it just wasn't required in this particular instance. I'm not saying that a parser is not a good thing. I mean, in fact, a parser is a phenomenal thing. Uh, it's just that there are occasions when sometimes a simple heuristic works reasonably well too. And we just got lucky here. My question is uh, related to my experience of text processing, which two typical problem comes up. One is that uh, time, like sometimes, like if you see the text of Mahabharata, many things are discussed in context of past or their background flashback. So time goes, like if you interpret with that time, it goes wrong. Second bigger problem I face, uh, I actually we face, try to come up was like you, I, these words were actually not the words, but they were rep they were actually representing something else. And uh, how we deal with these kind of problems? Okay. Uh, so the question is, one, Mahabharata talks about different periods of time. How do we uh, handle that? Secondly, words like you, we, I, they have different meanings in different contexts. How do we handle that? Uh, in this particular example, we just didn't. And there, again, uh, given that this is a talk on text visualization, I don't want to go into any of the techniques around uh, text analysis, if you will. but uh, let me just say that it's a pretty tough problem. Uh, you mentioned about sentiment analysis. You know, uh, do you have any open source APIs or something? Can you if you tell that? Okay. Uh, the question was, do we have any open source API on sentiment analysis? No, but a whole bunch of other people do. In fact, let me see if I can uh, find the code that we used to <laughs> do this analysis. one we used was viral heat. So viral heat provides an API where you can just pass in a phrase and you'll get the sentiment against it. This was the first one that early this morning I googled and found. You'll find hundreds of others. Uh, Python's NLTK has some parsers which will help you extract you know, the meaningful text out of it to send to these or any other APIs. And there are a number of others as well. Uh, yeah, sorry. One question. last question. So the question was, uh, uh, how scalable is uh, NLTK? Uh, it is a bit slow, but that's the nature of the algorithms themselves. To the extent that you can cache it, do some of the processing offline, and reuse those results, you're fine. Uh, I haven't seen too many analysis of uh, text data at a very large scale, so we haven't really encountered this problem. So the quick answer to that question, you know, is NLTK scalable? Is probably not, but don't know of a better alternative in Python. Arun. Great, really great presentation. Um, so maybe one thing you may want to kind of share uh, with the group is what are all the different tools that you use besides Python, NLTK, and uh, the viral heap that you talked about just now? So your, your question was what are the tools that we uh, might yeah, want? Various to tools that you would recommend people use. You know, uh, the hidden tool behind half of these analysis is actually Excel. <coughs> you know, take the data, uh, find a set of keywords, do a find equal to find a particular keyword, see if it exists or not. That's what led to the visualization, you know, a, a, a bunch of visualizations. Heck, the whole Calvin and Hobbes was typed in uh, Excel. Uh, so I would add Excel to the portfolio. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because I'm assuming that there would be a reasonable number of non-programmers in this uh, you know, uh, room as well. Uh, for example, if you wanted to create a word cloud, the way I would do it is type a bunch of, and a lot of people want to mock up word clouds. You know, you want to create it for marketing purposes. Open up Excel, type a bunch of words. Next to it, type 
no, I'm, I'm not going to show it to you, we don't have time. Uh, type a formula that says equal to REPT the word comma 10. That will repeat the word 10 times. Repeat the next word 5 times. And so you can have a bunch of words in the, fre in the frequency that you want. Copy and paste that text into Wordle and you're done. So for the non-programmer, I would say between Excel and Wordle, you've covered the bulk of uh, text visualization that you can probably hope to do in the, in the near future in a reliable fashion. Uh, beyond that, other than, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, Python NLTK, that's not the only tool set that one can use. There are a number of APIs that are emerging. The thing is, the state of this is not so stable today that I would be able to suggest something concrete. Uh, but no, apart from Python and uh, NLTK, regular expressions are your best friend. Thank you, Ajay. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Anand. Um, and Girish. Thanks, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll break for lunch now and be back at 2. <laughs>